five, four, three, two, one, ignition. And liftoff of Starliner and Atlas V, carrying two American heroes, drawing a line to the stars for all of us. Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. We've got a lot to talk about today, including what you just saw, the successful crew flight test of the Boeing Starliner. Yes, it's finally made it up there. After a few hiccups, though, a few hiccups and delay that was frustrating for space fans around the world. But, well, as you say, better safe than sorry. All right, we've got uh, we've got a few uh, interesting things to talk about today, in addition to the launch uh, of the Boeing Starliner. Well, of course, uh, you know, you can't say that there is a space fan anywhere in the world that's not looking at IFD4, Starship's uh, IFD4 flight test that is uh, just a few hours away from blasting off there in Texas. Uh, and we'll also be uh, discussing some very interesting uh, announcements from NASA uh, about the, the Mars Infrastructure Awards. We have uh, Ben Inoue from NASA JPL, Ozan Balik, uh, and of course, our special guest on the ground in Texas, Scott Walter. Scott, you've been hanging out, soaking up all the action. Where are you? What's it like? Give us a fill us in. Okay, I'm just leaving, well, passing through surveys. So between the, um, the launch towers and the build site, coming up on the build site right now, uh, we just spent quite a few hours down there and I didn't have enough sunblock, as you can probably tell, uh, the hot Texas sun. Right now, it's, oh, it's only showing at 91 degrees, but earlier it was showing like 108 degrees for us. But there's a little bit of breeze that helped keep it cool. Uh, we can see that the Starship is, is stacked, uh, ready to go. We have not heard of any issues or anything like that that uh, anyone's concerned about. They did get the FAA approval yesterday, so we know what's going ahead. Quite a lot of changes and improvements to everything. As a matter of fact, right now I'm driving on a road that is widened that has actually a real shoulder on it and no potholes. The last time I was here, it, the road surfaces were worse than what you would encounter in Michigan because the roads were not built for all the heavy trucks that were going through here. And so that's like one of the big upgrades that you can see already is like, wow, the road infrastructure has been changed to handle everything that has to come and go. And it's a much better shape. And we also notice a lot of power towers coming in here as well. So there used to be that wasn't there, which meant down at the different sites, they had to run their own generators, their own diesel generators to generate the, the power locally. So the changes in one year is um, quite noticeable here, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, I would give an arm and a leg to be where you are right now, Scott, but you've got yes, to have, yes, have, yes, have, yes. have fun enough for enough uh, so that it can go around the panel tonight. Right. <laughs> now, one thing that we did notice that we went around, we took lots of pictures, is that we've talked about the heat shielding before, and it, there appears to be what looks like two tiles that are missing uh, on yeah. the bottom side, right down uh, towards the very bottom, almost in the center. And I can't believe they put it up there and didn't notice it. <laughs> uh, and speak with some people, it's like, don't worry about it. It's not actually missing tiles. Uh, something that it's something else, but there may be other reports that it's something different. So I, I don't know what the scoop is on that, whether they're going to see them going out there in a few hours and putting something over it or whether it's just, that's how they're going to leave it or that was expected. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I I saw that post. Uh, I saw the post from you, and I couldn't um, help but uh, remember this comment that Sanjeev Sharma, the principal engineer at SpaceX. Okay. Uh, can you see the can you see the power lines as I'm driving by on the le on my left side right yeah. now? Yeah, just about. Yeah. I notice. I know it's kind of boring. It's rather prosaic going along here. Yeah, but those weren't there before, and those are designed to carrying uh, a fair amount of electricity. I would say. Uh, for the site that's down there. So again, that's just showing infrastructure improvements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So um, Scott, this was a, a post from you on X uh, a little while back, and this was uh, where you spotted what looked like uh, a couple of tiles missing. Okay. The reason I the reason I ask you that is because I saw this post on LinkedIn um, a few hours back, and Sanjeev Sharma, the principal engineer for SpaceX, commented. Uh, on this, and uh, he, I mean, this was very similar. You see this missing tile here at the bottom right. of Starship, right? And um, he commented saying, 
Uh, missing tile, I'm sure it's taken care of by now, but what an anno annoyance, quote unquote. Oh, so, okay, so, so he, he's getting a little bit more. All right, so um, I don't think it's because I posted that. This suddenly, oh my gosh, no, no, this, this, this was before you posted. It. Yeah. You know, that's before I posted. Okay, good. I assume they already knew, and it's all like, yeah, don't worry about it. They're probably going to get someone up there on a crane to take care of it. But we have not heard of anything that would delay the launch to Chrome. All right. But it could be sensors. What sort of sensors do you think they could be, if they are sensors? I mean, if it was sensors there, I, I mean, I don't know, thermal sensors or, or, or something else. I really place to put an antenna, because I know usually they stick some star uh, link antennas on there, but that's in the backside. So I, I was kind of surprised. That I don't think there's any sort of avionics or anything you'd want to put there. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what they'd want to, if they had some special sensors underneath there, but then I, I assume those sensors are embedded in something which also provides thermal protection. You, see, you don't really care about the data coming from that point. But there would be other ways to acquire the data without uh, sacrificing the integrity of the ship. So, yeah, it could, so it sounds like someone from SpaceX would know whether <laughs> yeah. that really is the child. So, I guess it is. So so I'll, I'll say that, uh, yeah, uh, everything that I've seen so far, I mean, Twitter has been talking about this for X. There's, there's been a lot of talk about this, and everyone's commenting on uh, how they still haven't fixed it. They clearly know about it. Uh, it seems intentional. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the latest stuff that I saw is said that they, they still hadn't, uh, haven't fixed it. And some of the speculation is, um, you know, it's over the – it, uh, the engine skirt, right? So if you have a burn through there, it's not it's not going to blow the ship up. Um, it could be that you know whether or not they have sensors on the outside, it could just be uh, that they, ex they left some tiles exposed there to uh, get a read on uh, the heat tolerance of the underlying skin um, and and just see like how. Um, and and also the the backing layer, right? Because I think that's still there. The foam, uh, or not not foam, but uh, the matting is is still there, right? Yeah. Uh, so Elon had expressed some concern about it, or he, or he had said that it's probably not going to survive reentry. Uh, so it's still so Starship is still susceptible to single tile loss. That was a big deal when he made that comment. It could be that they're they're testing it out in a in an area where uh, uh, they don't expect it to cause vehicle failure, but just see how well that backing layer survives reentry and how well the skin underneath it survives. They might have heat sensors behind it, right in the engine skirt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so yeah. what you're saying goes on is that the are are we seeing right now? Because I'm looking for at another post on the third that shows us actually three tiles that are missing, and one actually they removed the matting and painted over entirely yes. as they tend to leave it. Correct. Like that. Yeah. So so one is so two uh, seem to have the matting, and mm -hmm. one has uh, black paint on it. See, yeah. I mean, I'm like you said. It's it seems almost like it's set up for a test, uh, analyzed yeah. behavior. The you know what's happening there. That is, it is pretty interesting. I mean, they we know they love to test, so let it roll. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> hang on. So we, we see we see the matting in one, but not in two actually. Yeah. The other ones at the bottom, and, and the and there's one that, as sort of a, it's almost as if you know there's there's a something that's similar to the tile that's there in the substructure. Is that a sensor? You think? No, it's it's probably just a coating. Um, so mm -hmm. high emissivity coating. Mm -hmm. Um, emissivity is uh, what uh, it is like a measure of what fraction of total um, possible black body radi radiation you can emit. Um, so if you have a high emissivity coating, that's more efficient at uh, rejecting heat radiatively. You know, black tends right. to be high emissivity in, in both uh, visible and IR. You can have white that is close to that. But it, that looks like a, a like the same coating that's on on the rest of the ship, which is just a, you know as high as you can reasonably and you know, reliably cheaply get. All right, so I mean we're very we're very clear that um, it's it's that 
I mean, everybody at Star uh, at at um, at SpaceX and and Elon is, has stressed this repeatedly that making re-entry, making it through re-entry, is the focus of this launch of this IFT four test. So, I mean, what what are the sort of risks that we're talking about here? Um, uh, just open so if, the, if this guys. is just over if the it skirt, doesn't make then, it, oh, if it doesn't if, make it, yeah, if it doesn't make it. Is it back to the drawing board to kind of completely reevaluate the materials um, for the tiles or a, or a whole different heat shield technology? I think it probably depends on how badly it doesn't make it. You know, I, I think that um, if it doesn't make it because some of the tiles fall off, then that that won't cause them to reevaluate the, uh, the material necessarily, but mm -hmm. perhaps just the attachment mechanism which of course is a function of the material but you know you, you theoretically you can you can you know the brittleness of the material is known uh, like the mechanical and uh, properties of the material are known uh and i i think that you can engineer uh an attachment mechanism for this that that will work um i don't think that they're necessarily going to get information out of this that's going to tell them oh it's it's not worth it but if they find that they're getting more heat then the material can handle they might choose to tweak the material because you can get um you know silica tiles that are rated higher or, or it, it might be um they go to a slightly different refractory material um but um it might also just be that they find some hot spots where they introduce some something else it could be rcc it could be yeah whatever that has that has um higher temperature limits I, I might want it, to mention, okay, let, it should work for most of the, the vehicle yeah scott go ahead. So from what i could see around the, the back end of the booster they had a rather interesting tiling pattern behind the flaps where there was sort of exposed material right where the hinge joint is uh on the back side but then suddenly you see some tiles put in there so it's almost like they're expecting from the flow the plasma flow that comes around it won't be coming right up against the flap of the backside, but there will be a little bit on the fuselage section. Um, I took a couple of pictures of that, but um, I didn't I didn't upload them to Twitter yet uh, to show up, but it's, it's rather interesting to see that there's some parts that are exposed. That I thought, oh, I thought they would cover them up, and it must be because that's where they're anticipating the hotspots to be. And again, it might be that they learned a little bit from IFT3 uh, from looking at that to get an idea of what the, the flow is around there to model it a little bit better. But again, remember, they're modeling where the hotspots are. They don't really know. <laughs> so I think Ozan's right when he says that, you know, that could be that you put everything where you think it is and you discover uh, there's a hotspot that you didn't expect. All right. I, I came across this picture and Ozan and, um, and Ben, if you want to chime in and uh, Scott, just what are those little white circles that we're seeing at the corners? Are those what are they fasteners? Are they clips? What what are they? It's a good question. I was wondering that myself. <laughs> because I mean, it, if, if, Scott, if it's one you know? of the clips, it's got to be at the back, right? I mean, you wouldn't have it coming right through the material of the tile. I, there are metals that can handle pretty high temperatures, um, so it's not out of the question that you could have a have an exposed metal head over there. Uh, but yeah, I, there's not enough to be able to say what that is. It could be a little paint circle. Uh, it, could, it could just be a, a marker. Um, <laughs> I can't tell. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. All right. I, I found a picture of someone that that found one of these tiles after the last launch um, and took a real close picture of it. And it looks like it's actually like a paint pen or a marker just kind of to indicate it was... I don't know, maybe they actually have a directional uh, installation nice. pattern. Oh. Uh, so it looks like they're, they're putting them all up, but yeah. Nice. That looks like, uh, all right. Is that numbered? This is similar to what we've seen earlier, right? Ozan, if you remember the, the chat we had mm. with um, with Ed, mm. we were talking mm. about the fasteners. Yeah. So these, you know, and these, these look pretty similar to. So yeah. these, these were what were recovered, right? Ben? Yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like. So, um, marker. Yeah, we'll find these, out. These tiles—they have no ablative properties whatsoever, right? 
Are they? Um, yeah, they're just entirely just high heat resistance. Yeah. So insulating, it's radiative uh, rejection, and just limit the soak into the vehicle. I was I was wondering if maybe they were you know with these missing tiles they were trying to see if uh, the ablative you know cushion so to say was going to yeah. protect like a, a lost tile but if there's no ablative properties to it then yes so the uh, tiles themselves are not uh, ablative mm -hmm. uh, as far as I under uh, understand uh, there was some speculation about whether the the that white matting under it um, mm. would have some as like a backup layer. Sure. Or if it was just useful as for, for added insulation and maybe a, it provided some mechanical um, you know, cushioning. Yep. Um, but you know, that, that latest comment from Elon about uh, they probably, they probably won't survive reentry. Kind of <laughs> made people, yeah, you know, re examine their assumptions. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and it was it was it was always an open question, mm -hmm. and, yeah. I, and I guess maybe for SpaceX it, it's still an open question. It uh, it's to be seen how how uh, useful it is as an ablator, right? Yeah. If it gets yeah. anything, if it gets hot enough, it's gonna sure. you know melt, burn, or uh, evaporate. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, I think the question is always just: Is it gonna you know form a little gas bubble long enough? To right. Be useful. Yeah. Uh, and most materials, no. All right. <laughs> All right. So there was this really interesting um, uh, post on X from Eric Berger, the Oz, Oz technical guy. Yes. Was it, was that the one about that they don't, if they, it's yeah, okay if the, they run, as long the as test, they run the test the induced damage it's exception. It's yes. clearly a test. Exactly. So, yeah. so long as the run is within expected parameters and it, within yeah. the, Expected debris area, everything's fine. It will not prevent them from pushing ahead. Correct. So yes, the, the approved they're, they're sections include the failure of the thermal team. shield, the flap system, if it's unable to provide sufficient control under high dynamic pressure, and the failure of the Raptor engine system yeah. during the landing burn. So, how much of wiggle room do you think this gives SpaceX moving moving forward? A lot, right? So, if the main issue with control on the last one was due to detachment of the hot staging ring. And if they, if they were able to solve that, because there, there was a little bit of a control issue, right? It wasn't just, so, so that's the first thing that I was thinking of. If the, this exception covers the flaps, but not the grid fins, and, you know, how does that work? Um, and it kind of makes sense because they're, they're planning to do booster recovery sooner than, than ship recovery. So you really want to get that. Probably IFT5. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, that, that seems really uh, risky, but on uh, if, they, if they, uh, yeah. If they can get a, a good, uh, I mean, they for, for them to do it on IFT5, they would have to get, get a good landing burn on yeah. IFT4. I, I'm not holding my breath, hmm. but it would be it would be great to see. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think other than that, it should it should perform close enough to. Now, oh, the, the other thing is, uh, does that cover the boost back burn it, it covers the the landing burn but does it cover because uh, because last time uh there was an issue with uh, early shutdown and the boost back burn but if they can get past yeah. that then it seems like it should be they should be good to i think go what it was it was flight. it was was it was it six engines that failed that shut down or seven out of the 13. i can't remember it might and then i think there like were just two that that relit finally yeah and that was just not enough and then if I'm not mistaken, there were there were problems with um, the fuels, the fuel supply to the engines. So there's a host of of um, alterations and modifications that are probably in there and for sure in there in, in this new uh, in this new stack. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out as well. So it's not just I mean while everybody's talking about it, obviously, you know the focus is on on Starship making reentry, but there's there's a lot of of uh, links in this chain and a lot of weak spots that need to be mm -hmm. worked out and this will this test will probably prove whether all those links are good to go for the future right azam uh, at least some of those links yeah i think so, there's some stuff that's not getting tested that i wish was getting tested but Such it, it saves them uh, engine relight yeah that's 
it, it, in my mind, it's not, it's not useful until it, you can get engine relight uh, for mm -hmm. on the ship. It doesn't have to be the vacuum engine, but ship uh, relight um, so that you can do an actual orbital insertion and then deorbit, do a power deorbit maneuver. Right, right now, they're, they're still on the suborbital trajectory. Hopefully, by IFT5, they will move on to to that. But until then, it's not it's not really an orbital launch vehicle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, unless you go by the uh, you know, CZ5, Long March 5B example, then you could you could still <laughs> you could still do that. Uh, just leave your upper stage there. But that would be. Um, Really bad optics to leave a yeah. leave a hundred and fifty ton hunk of metal uh, yeah. on a on a on a random deorbit. Um, <laughs> fine. Yeah. All right. Let, let's 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 go back to uh, the man on the ground, Scott. Um, uh, is there anything interesting that you're picking up ahead of the of five D four? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, there I you actually, oh, so <laughs> we just made it through the the, the customs checkpoint. It actually was rather interesting because the traffic backed up and I had FSD on and it was just like following traffic. And suddenly on the other side, a police vehicle came by and behind it was like one of these big stretch kind of um, air conditioned, nice uh, limousine transport vehicles that was probably transporting either VIPs or maybe it's like SpaceX employees because they do have a shuttle that goes back and forth. So they held up the line on the other side so this vehicle could pass. And as soon as FSD saw that, did that those two vehicles passed, I said, oh, I can go in that lane too. <laughs> not realizing it was not supposed to. So I had to disengage. So it's a, it's rather interesting to see how the AI can suddenly be tricked by something like that. And, and that's like a weird edge case that I have to report. And it does, I was just kind of curious on who the VIPs were potentially in that, unless again, maybe it's just a SpaceX employee shuttle because there is one from Brownsville uh, to the build facility. Yeah. All right, Scott. Is there anything that you're picking up uh, on the ground? Uh, you you did mention the the ton of YouTubers down there. Um, what's the buzz like? Uh, what's what's the focus of, of all the discussions? Any insider notes expected, that you could share with us? Yeah, they they all expect it to go tomorrow. Okay. Um, so so uh, I'm not hearing anything from anyone thinking that it, that it wouldn't go tomorrow. So based on whatever sources they have, there's nothing saying that they're concerned. And again, I've you know I've heard the discussion about the tiles that maybe they're just kind of accepting the fact that well, uh, maybe you know those tiles are going to be problematic or they're going to be repaired or something. I think they are really keen to get the booster uh, working, and they're you know they're probably willing. And as Ozon's kind of talked about, maybe they should just think about making Starship an expendable vehicle for now, mm -hmm. and focus more on getting the booster. And doing all the testing on that so it might be that you know they really are concentrating on getting the booster to perform correctly and uh, it'll be interesting tomorrow to see if the chopsticks are operating at the same time that the booster is landing mm -hmm. whether they try to virtually link the two together yeah uh, just to to simulate yeah yes why not why not that that, that would be a, a pretty good idea i think to do something like that yeah yes. um and nothing else in, in like the discussion you know if they really land that, if, if everything goes well with the landing of the booster, I think there's a high possibility that they might try it for IFT5. Yeah. If everything goes exactly as they expect, they might actually try it. I know most people think they might try to do a two or three tests before they do it, but there's a strong possibility. And I think by that time, they'll have the second Mechazilla That's, set up for that. I was just going to so, say that, yes. So they can do away with one if need be. Yeah, yeah. If it comes crashing, excitement down, yeah. guaranteed. Yes, excitement guaranteed. Indeed. No matter what, excitement guaranteed. <laughs> um, should we talk about Starliner? Absolutely. I was just. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we we ought to have begun with it, but of course, as excitement gets, uh, you know, yes. uh, got away with us. I right, Starbase. So, yeah, got we've got a guy at Starbase, so we might as well start with that. Okay, so we finally had a successful launch today. Um, mm -hmm. Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams were on board. They headed to the International Space Station. Starliner had an interesting flight trajectory. It was designed to be flat and long uh, to ensure better safety in case of emergency and flight abort. 
it also kept the Starliner that's uh, been christened Calypso uh, from splashing down in blackout zones uh, in the North Atlantic. Um, and Ozan, I'm hoping um, you can, you and Ben and Scott, um, whoever wants to go first, can help us understand why is this particular trajectory was chosen and what's the importance of um, not landing in case of an emergency in one of these blackout zones. Can you can you pull up the trajectory? Yeah, so as far as uh, the flatter tra trajectory, this is something where uh, Atl Atlas, uh, the Atlas upper, upper stage Centaur uh, is a traditionally very low thrust. It, it has a single RL10 engine, which provides about 10 tons of thrust for a stage that, that weighs about, uh, that weighs over 20 tons before you put the 13-ish ton Starliner on top of it. So you got, you know, less than uh, one third of uh, in thrust to weight ratio um, at stage separation, which basically, uh, even even though it is it stage is high, um, which helps with some of those uh, gravity losses, um, you still need kind of a lofted trajectory so that it can uh, it, it has some vertical velocity to lose before it, it it can flatten out because it's such a long burn on that on that second stage. Um, now for crew safety, what they one of the changes that they need to make on Atlas was to have a two engine centaur that, that doubles the thrust so it can have uh, a less lofted trajectory. And then and as far as I know, the reason for that is that uh, when you have, do have that lo lofted trajectory, if you need to abort for whatever reason in before you get close to orbital velocity, then you're going to be coming in uh, uh, quite steep, right? Uh, you're going, <laughs> you know, it goes up, uh, must come down. Uh, if you, if you have high vertical velocity, um, then, and, and then you just cut out before you, you reach orbit, you're going to, you're going to have a steep dive, um, and that's going to increase heat load. Uh, but, uh, perhaps more importantly, um, in for, you know, the heat load, the, the thermal flux is not that big of a deal for an ablative heat shield, but, um, it's going to increase your G loads, right? Especially if you end up in a ballistic reentry, where you don't have uh, um, control, roll control that that can give you a little bit of lift. Um, so that can potentially push the the G loading on reentry past uh, safe limits for for humans on board. So you do want a little bit of a shallower trajectory, and that's what why, why that second engine was added. And this is the as far as I know, I know this is the only Atlas configuration, N N22, um, uh, the one designed for crude flight that has that flies with the dual engine Centaur. For the benefit of the wider audience, if you can uh, help us understand the what does this mean for this configuration of a launch vehicle? Um, so we've seen so many delays for various reasons with the rocket as well as. Um, other reasons that we're still trying to understand. I believe the last one, uh, it was the countdown that was stopped, and we aren't very clear what really happened. But so going forward, there, there was a it, there was hard, hardware failure in the launch sequence failure. here. So all right. Was, so uh, the, the moving forward, cars. what does this mean? Is this now a, a viable second um, space vehicle to take astronauts from American soil to the ISS and back? Probably. Or is it still? Good? Probably. I mean, okay. So, a um, couple of things to note: they they haven't uh, they haven't docked with the ISS yet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, I think that's that's happening early tomorrow. Um, and they haven't done reentry yet with crew. I don't remember the full scope of the problems that the the last two um, uh, uncrewed flights had. Mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully got fully worked out, but it's it's you know hopefully uh, the two astronauts um, will be safe. Um, but I, I think it's it might be a little bit early to break out the champagne in terms of uh, mm -hmm. whether or not Starliner needs a little bit more work. Hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully everything is is smooth sailing or it, any issues that crop up are minor. Right. Um, beyond that. Uh, an important piece of context, the, the Russians, and they did this with Dragon as well, they want to see an operational flight before they put uh, their uh, crew on board. And that's, that'd be like a full duration operational flight. So 
there so that's that's one of the things that there's not there's not going to be a uh, even though we're doing seed exchanges there's not going to be a russian astronaut on starliner one which if this flight goes well then that will hopefully be early next year uh mm -hmm. and then uh, starliner two would probably be in 2026 and that would be the first time that we would see the the russians trusting it enough to um put an astronaut on board right so a little bit of trivia um it's only if they take off from russian soil are they cosmonauts correct oh, i'm they, sorry they cosmonauts. yes <laughs> uh, but if they but if they take off from american soil then they i don't know I, I think I, they're still I cosmonauts I think that, yeah yeah is it I think yeah. they're still cosmonauts. Yeah, we we may call them something else, but they probably still call themselves <laughs> cosmonauts. Yeah. Okay. So that's independent of where they where they take off from, right? Probably. But it's it's. Okay. I mean, it's just like the like taikonauts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah. Well, actually, it's not like that because I think I think Westerners made up that that, that term, right? Correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. Uh, probably. No, I think yeah. they call themselves. But then taikonauts. sometimes sometimes we 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 call them Chinese astronauts and. It's like, yeah, so, so, yeah. so that, you know, my bad. I, I was not sufficiently respectful to, and, and mindful of the, of the history there, but uh, <laughs> cosmonauts. No, no, no. It's, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was uh, something that came up in the back of my mind. I was like, hang space on. Space so attendant, is... maybe? Who we'll goes space <laughs> attendant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want me getting uh, into trouble, do you? <laughs> I, I do have a question, though. What, Assuming that uh, Starliner is determined to be a viable launch vehicle, um, or yeah, you know, launch system. What what are we flying it on after? Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, that's, that's the open no question. Longer assumption available. is Vulcan. Yeah. Yes, but, Ben. But... Thank you. Thank you. That was what I was <laughs> going for. <laughs> I I think yeah. There's viability and feasibility. You know, where feasibility just doesn't make sense. But do you know, Atlas Five is no longer. You know, that may have been one of the last launches, right? Yeah. So what now? There are a number of vehicles that it could theoretically fly on. Uh, including Neutron, actually, huh. um, as well as, of course, Falcon 9. Um, oh, and... I know. Boeing has another big rocket they might put it on. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> It'd be great if they put like four or five of them on there. Just... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the minivan on the SLS. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Vulcan is what's generally assumed but i think that it's too early to count on that uh, vulcan is not yet human rated um and ula is basically paying waiting for it seems like ula is waiting for boeing to pay for it and boeing is not it's not clear that boeing is actually intending to fly they may they, they they probably don't know yet if they're going to fly past the contracted six operational flights is there any yeah. chance that we see a Starliner launch on a Falcon 9? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean, think so? we've we've seen um, Cygnus launch on a Falcon 9, and I think that that was not that was not expected, right? Um, okay. In terms Starliner of interoperability, how, how uh, difficult uh, is it to to switch between launch vehicles? There's some work involved. But it's it's not like it's not like a full research certification or anything. It's it's, it's easier than building a, or human rating a, a rocket that's not human rated. Yeah, that's for sure. Which even that is not for most rockets. It's not it's not like that. It, it's not like uh, uh, designing qualifying a, a new rocket. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, because so, that was what SpaceX had to do with the Falcon Nine Block Five, right? Um, and yeah. that actually, they had a, a timeline set for doing it, and they hit the timeline, and, um, which is yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It would be interesting to see, I think, somewhat ironic to see a Starliner go up on a Falcon Nine, though. Yeah, it would. Yeah. It would be fun. It'd be funny. <laughs> It'd be great. I'm I mean, sure Elon would have a lot to say. For <laughs> I, sure. I just uh, this post is talking about the timeline. Yeah. Too many non-technical yes. managers at Boeing, he says. Well, it would be like you know the shareholders <laughs> of Amazon um, sued uh, because yes. the, because Project Kuiper wasn't being launched on SpaceX vehicles, and it was you know perceived to be a personal kind of avoidance. But when your shareholders want to make money, then and Boeing is a publicly traded company, 
their shareholders could push to to get the project moving if there's an opportunity to recoup some of the costs that were lost. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's that was, something where, it, it, you know, if they have to compete with SpaceX on price, um, I think it's reasonably expected that the Dragon itself is cheaper to operate than Starliner. But I'm sure it is. Um, Falcon 9 is also cheaper to operate than any version of uh, Vulcan, uh, let alone I think for this, you would need uh, probably a uh, VC2. Um, I don't think that the that Slick Vulcan has enough payload capacity um, mm -hmm. to launch Starliner. Um, yeah, I should probably double check that. But yeah, I mean, that's that's not going to be, that's going to be, a, it's, it's, it's probably cheaper than, than Atlas N22, but Almost certainly, but it's not going to be as cheap as as Falcon Nine. I, I think it will be a, an interesting question that Boeing's probably working on answering if they haven't done it already. Is is whether it even makes sense to pursue further launches? You know, there there's a big yeah. hole that they what they've mean? created by, you know, they've they've lost a lot of money on uh, the Starliner development. Um, Do you mean a write off? At this well, stage, if, if they just stopped here said we don't have a launch vehicle they stopped the bleeding um and the there's you know there's an upside they could potentially make more money with this contract but if their analysts say that it's going to cost us more to keep this going including identifying a new launch vehicle etc then they may decide just we don't see it we've completed like one benchmark of this contract and we won't pursue you know the other six launches but yeah I, so they do have launch vehicles for the other um for the other six oh they do they have yeah so the atlas is for those are reserved it's just okay. Okay. beyond that um so beyond their contracted launches they a don't they don't have customers yet mm -hmm. and b they don't have a launch vehicle yet for anything beyond the beyond the six so it'd be up to nasa to give them the incentive to even consider yeah. going beyond that um yeah. pretty much yeah, because I'm just thinking. I mean, if you're if you're a corporate entity, you want to get your payload up to orbit, and you have a choice between Dragon and Starliner. I mean, what are you going to go with? I mean, your cargo in this case is only paid for essentially by NASA, and uh, I don't True. think there's any service differentiation between the two providers. I, I don't think you would ever choose to pay. There would be one one reason, I guess. You want you would want to maintain a certain amount of competition in the marketplace. Um, although SpaceX is delivering a better product for a better price now, uh, if you give them complete control over supply, you can't guarantee that that's going to remain that way. That's true. So well, I, I think there's so a SpaceX good it helps to be years ahead of the competition. It, it certainly does, um, but it's also important, I think. For uh, a, from a customer standpoint, it's important to keep the pressure on the heels of, of the front runner. Otherwise, absolutely, yeah. you end up with Boeing. Right. Hey, yeah. competition is good for everybody. Yeah. Provided it, I mean, provided it, it is a healthy, fair competition is good for everyone. Yeah. 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 And realistic. Yep. In in this day and age, I think um, it's it's a bit unrealistic. To expect Boeing to really compete with Starli um, Starliner to compete with uh, Dragon, sure. Um, given the cadence of Dragon, and I mean, if you have Starship in the next eighteen months, um, get to a point of some amount of maturity, is there anything that can compete with SpaceX? Any company that can compete with SpaceX in terms of cost of payload to orbit? I don't think so. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Cost cost per kilo, no. Uh, for a, a given contracted launch, I think it's uh, it's it's feasible. And I, I think what's going to drive um, NASA and the federal government or the U.S. government in general to keep sponsoring other companies is availability. And you know, you, you would hate you would hate to have a very important launch scheduled. Um, and there's only one launch provider, but they get a more lucrative offer from somewhere else. And they just say, sorry, Uncle Sam, we're <laughs> we're going to go ahead and pass on this one. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important to have a second launch provider that can, that can provide, you know, these 
semi heavy lift capabilities. Yeah. Sure. That's For NASA anyway. Yeah. You seriously yeah. think that uh, SpaceX could be a monopoly that could decide? It doesn't appear it that way. I mean, yeah, I think I mean, they could. Just... NASA is basically propping Boeing up in the space industry right now. And I, I think that if it was just up to free market forces, SpaceX could, you know, annihilate almost everyone else right now. Right. It is. I mean, this yeah. year you're probably going to yeah. have what well, ninety percent of global, I mean, launch to orbit just by SpaceX alone. Over ninety, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah something like um, eighty. Yeah, yeah. Eighty percent last year, right? Most plus. of the rest of that ten percent is, uh, you know, China. decisions by yeah, yeah. And what's not China is decisions by the U.S. government to use an alternate launch provider just to keep them as an option, um, even probably at significantly higher cost. I, I don't think private industry will do that, but I do think there's a um, strategic advantage that the the government sees in making sure that there are multiple providers available. And I, I don't disagree with it. I just yeah. uh, wish that the other, other orgs could do better. Close the gap a little bit. Yeah. Instead yeah. of letting it widen further and further. Yep. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully some of the newer newer entrants will be able to get there eventually. It's gonna be hard for them to break into this you know larger launch vehicle uh, market. And I, yeah. I think but I think we need other players there. Yeah. I mean thankfully the, the DOD has um, provided an on ramp option for yeah. them, right? Um and I hope that um, well, what's going on with the sale of ULA? Is that going to happen? I, I, I've been rumors. Yeah, I mean, I've been really looking forward to seeing. It, it seems from watching some of the things that Tori Bruno has talked about that they're eager to be acquired by a forward-thinking organization. Um, yes, and they're just waiting for the you know knight in shining armor to come through. I. I I like Tori Bruno and I like what they're trying to do. Uh, Any so speculation sure. on who that knight in shining armor could be? It was blue for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, the the reporting has been that uh, it's it's going to be it's likely to be the blue, blue mm -hmm. origin. So um, I, I would be I'm a big like a good acquisition for uh, blue origin. I think you know the the contracting and connections alone um, would be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Once they have a vehicle to fly regularly. <laughs> I mean, I do wonder about the future of Vulcan, though, if Blue acquires ULA, because their goal is to build a vehicle that can do everything that Vulcan can, can and then some. Sure. But cheaper. So if they succeed in that, which uh, hopefully it's going to be in the next few years, uh, they're hoping to launch this year. And if they can get their cadence up this decade, then. I don't see. Um, I don't think we may. I don't think we're gonna. Like, if that happens, I don't think we're gonna see a, a whole lot of flights on on Vulcan. And, I, and by that, I don't mean, you know, five or ten. I think they'll they'll probably get to uh, quite a few dozens, but we might not see triple digits. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that we're gonna see a lot of flights on Vulcan anyway. Well, I mean, they they do have a backlog right now of. Uh, over 70, maybe like eight, over 80 uh, flights. Over how many years, though? Uh, I think probably in five or six. Okay. That's, that's not bad. Yeah. I, I'm sure there are lessons to be learned by Blue Origin uh, about really a, an effective implementation of their engines. So that that's value added for Blue Origin as an acquisition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It well, be we'll have to. Yeah, it'd be interesting. We'll have to wait and see. All right, we've we've got um, another topic to talk about today, and that's the um, the bars commercial missions. And there's been some interesting activity in the past uh, weeks or so, uh, month or so. So NASA selected nine companies for its Exploring Mars Together program. They will perform feasibility studies of commercial approaches to deliver spacecraft to Mars and provide services there. Now there were. 12 awards in all. Some companies received multiple awards. For example, Firefly Aerospace, Impulse Space, Lockheed Martin, Astrobotic, Blue Origin, 
uh, that we were just talking about, the United Launch Alliance each received awards for small and large spacecraft or hosted payloads to Mars, Astrobotic, Albedo Space, and Redwire won awards for Mars Imaging Services, and Lockheed Martin, Blue Origin, and SpaceX won awards for Communications Relay Services um, on Mars. So that's really interesting and um, something that we should talk about. I think, I mean, um, it's not just Leo, it's not just Artemis, but it's good to see that there's some forward movement when it comes to Mars missions as well. Um, and it it's encouraging to see um, all of this happening. We've, we're still waiting for the MSR, um, the MSR announcements, Mars sample return announcements. NASA had asked for, uh, for proposals from private industry. Uh, that's going to be something very, very interesting to look out for. But in the meantime, you now have these, um, these 12 awards. Ben, take us through them. What what is it uh, all about, and what does it mean, really? Uh, so, first, there um, it's important to note that these are study awards. So, mm -hmm. no testing, no hardware. This is an award to actually build a satellite to to help support Mars infrastructure. There, yeah, two to two hundred to three hundred grand for twelve weeks to uh, think about um, concepts. It's very similar to the. Uh, the Mars sample return commercial proposals where, you know, you submit ideas, you get awarded uh, money and time to come up with a more detailed uh, design architecture for our mission. Uh, with that said, I, I think, you know, these are, it is important, very important to think about the future of the infrastructure um, for these missions, because with our, flagships we spend billions of dollars uh, to go get a vehicle or a rover or, you know in the future a helicopter there uh, and there really cannot be much value provided by these expensive flashy missions without you know the the satellites in orbit to to make the relays um to do the high uh, high fidelity mapping of the ground so we can use that for right. navigation and control um, yeah. So essentially the backbone of all future missions to Mars, right? Yeah. Um, transport, imaging, communication. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's it's the, the phone company essentially is what you're hiring um, mm -hmm. to set up shop over at Mars. Uh, and, and it's forward thinking. And I think um, it's exciting that it's 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 money meant to incentivize companies to start considering these things and uh, forecasting them as high priority um, services to be provided. So I, I'm encouraged to see it. Um, it means that we're not completely giving up on Mars um, in my lifetime. Yeah. It is exciting to see that the uh, the draft uh, Mars exploration uh, proposal that, that NASA is looking at, that this is all in the context of, is, is that they want to go every, uh, every synod. Yeah, yeah, we, we should. Yeah, we really we should. should. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as we as we bump the frequency up, uh, we both drop the the cost per mission down, and we reduce the the criticality of a failure of a mission. So, if you're going every uh, every twenty, was it twenty four and a half months, twenty three months, twenty six ish, no, twenty six months, um, and you and you miss, and you know one has a problem you don't make it then well, whatever you got another one two years later so um, when we have these very expensive flagship missions that, that are just so expensive that we can't afford for them to fail then it, it you know it's an exponential cost growth kind of thing i would love to see more missions going more often um, yeah same yeah you know there's there's been a lot of criticism of nasa in the recent past um given the cadence of development of the Chinese um, space program. Um, you know, there's been, you know, they've just had a lander, uh, I think was it on the on the South Pole uh, uh, with a sample return? About 45 ship. degrees south, but in the yeah. uh, South Pole like in a basin. So it's, it's yeah, uh, yeah. And also the way um, I think NASA has been approaching the Artemis Accords uh, and the difference between how uh, NASA is, is getting countries to sign on 
versus how China is getting countries like uh, Russia, et cetera, to, China, to, to sign on to, to their program. And it seems that there, there's a bit of a divergent focus. It's, and uh, it's just, I'm wondering, do you feel that there's, there's a, it's like the new Wild West and we're going to see a bit of friction in space, uh, at least beginning with the moon, with the lunar missions? I, I don't think that we as, I don't think that NASA or the US is taking China as a, comp, you know, as a competitive entity in space very seriously. I think we, I've listened to some hearings and they, um, I've heard Administrator Nelson say that this is the reason why he needs the funding, et cetera. But I, the actions that I see implemented um, don't reflect the sense of urgency that you should be exhibiting if you really thought that you ought to be in the race is yeah. a is a priority i don't and but it is it's it's a problem i i think this is both national pride uh it's um it's a big deal we shouldn't we shouldn't just roll over and and give up uh our essentially control and dominance of space because uh because there's no reason we have to you know we just yeah. have to be smart with the way our, we spend our money and, and yeah what do you, do you and, feel and it goes Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, in addition to national pride and uh, you know, the U.S.'s place, uh, it goes, it touches on everything from trade relations and political mm -hmm. and geopolitical influence, exactly, uh, to um, a technological um, footing that 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 has carryover into other industries, um, to eventually, uh, you know, that that sort of space dominance has is going to have implications when space is not just um, a novelty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When it's not just a place where we put our sat satellites and, and, you know, throw up data and bring back data and, mm -hmm. and do scientific research, but, but a place where we actually extract uh, uh, a lot of resources, resources from. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I see a future where, uh, you know, it's probably not in my lifetime or my child's lifetime, but, you know, it would be nice if all of the dirty manufacturing stuff was somewhere out in space near where yeah. the resources on actually are. On an asteroid are. or another planet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then Earth is just this habitat literally for humanity where it's every everywhere is a protected green zone. Um, and that would be lovely. Uh, yeah. The Bezos but Bezos. I, can't, I, I can't help but wonder, no, I mean, if, if, if the Chinese program um, evolves at the rate at with it, which it is right now, and given the problems we're seeing with uh, the lunar missions and Artemis and the delays. Um, do you think there's a possibility that countries that have signed on to the Artemis Accords might switch because they see a greater benefit in aligning with the Chinese when it comes to space exploration? I don't think so. Maybe those for the that are like not really uh, that heavily subscribed into the uh, communist versus capitalist approach to existence um maybe they would consider it but i think that alliances uh in in space exploration are more closely determined by a, a country's you know essentially economic or belief system um or even cultural values than the content of the awards themselves it's kind of like a republican and democratic party you know a bunch of people agree to a whole bunch of things that they don't even think that they know um but because their party is going with it, hmm. and and the other thing is that I, as far as I know, the uh, the two initiatives are not mutually exclusive. It's possible for a country to be both part of the arms accords and also uh, the collaboration. Yeah, I think so. At the moment, yeah. at the moment, but but when the heat really gets on, you know, it's um, yeah, yeah. I expect well, there, there's a lot that's that's uh, in flux right now geopolitically. That yes. you know, in five or ten years. Um, things may not things may not be the same. Well, okay, guys, uh, it's been a, a great chat. Um, we've unfortunately lost Scott. Uh, we hope Oops. to have him back <laughs> for the for the IFT yes. for uh, mm -hmm. for launch, and uh, hopefully we'll have you guys back as well. But um, I'm sure for, his car is off following some VIP is... bus, you know, <laughs> on FST mode. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's learning how to spot celebrities is what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, it's been great to catch up. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, yeah. wonderful talking to you again. So thank you for your time. Sounds good. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So.